Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship on Good Friday. The Good Friday liturgy is simple and somewhat austere in tone. We gather together in solemn celebration of the victory of Christ on the cross. After worshipping in the church, we leave the church on Good Friday quietly and prayerfully so that the contrast on Easter Day where we celebrate the risen Christ, will be all the greater. We will finish our service in silence after the Stations of the Cross. The service continues then on Easter Sunday. Join me in prayer. For us and for our salvation, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Holy God, who has opened our ears to hear your word and our lips to proclaim your truth, open our eyes this day to see in the cross the revelation of your love through Jesus the crucified, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, be honour and praise, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand for the first song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
please be seated. In penitence and faith, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Eternal God, whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we fail to fulfil your will at times. Though you have bound yourself to us, we will not bind ourselves to you. In Jesus Christ, we love you freely, but we refuse your love and withhold ourselves from others. We do not love you fully or love one another as you command. In your mercy, forgive us and cleanse us. Lead us once again to your table and unite us to Christ, who is the bread of life and the vine from which we grow. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear then Christ's word of grace to us. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's now remain seated for the song above all.
Karen will now bring us today's Bible readings. Okay, uh, our first reading is from um, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 to 25. Day after day, Every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he <laughs> waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And then our next reading is um, from John chapter 18, uh, verses 1 to 18. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father and lord of Cephas, the high priest that year. Cephas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Okay. And then we come to um, uh, Peter's first denial. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. 
the other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's now stand for the beautiful song, Were You There? Please be seated. The first Bible reading reading we just heard is a challenging reading, certainly, but it's a really meaningful test, both for the people for whom it was originally written and for us today. It's about Christ's sacrifice. Paul argues that the blood of Jesus replaced the old covenant in the Old Testament by which people could earn their salvation. Through Christ, their sins could be forgiven, one's sins forgotten and one's heart and mind prepared for the implantation of God's law. As we are told, Christians enjoy a privileged life through Christ. As all who believe in him all of us have access to God, God in his grace 
and to the kingdom of God. This helps to chase away fear and gives the believer lively hope. Christ's new way is in opposition to the covenant of works that says we can earn our salvation through works. This is the belief that was previously promoted by the Jewish leaders. The way through Christ will always be open to those who believe and who have faith. The curtain in the temple, the curtain in the temple in the reading, signified the body of Christ. When he died, the veil of the temple was torn and the earth shook. The tearing of the curtain in the temple symbolised the tearing away of the barrier between people and God. In verse 20, we are told, the curtain is now through his flesh, meaning that the flesh of Christ has become the new curtain through which access to God is now possible. God's presence would not stay hidden behind the curtain. The death of Jesus changed the world. As it says in the reading, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most high place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. The book of Hebrews is a message on staying faithful for the Jesus-believing Jews at the time. They were probably living in Italy and they were in danger of falling away from their faith. They were challenged by Paul to persevere in their faith. The goal of writing the passage was to show the superiority of the truth that was revealed by God. The new covenant is a new relationship between God and humans. And this new covenant is mediated by Jesus. This new covenant included all people of faith, both Jews and Gentiles. All were encouraged to respond to the threat of persecution by recommitting to salvation bought by Jesus. These were really difficult times, time of great persecution. Interestingly, they, like us, were encouraged to hold fast to their faith, to keep on track, trust that the way of Christ really is the way. Jesus cared for us as we face challenges along the journey, and he also cared for the people for whom this reading was first written. We can then experience, through our faith and hope, we experience absolute joy in the kingdom of God. We experience what is the full, abundant life as shown to us by Jesus Christ in his life. <coughs> Encouragement of the community is also discussed in that reading. We are told that we need to, and these are great words, encourage each other on the way. And this includes meeting together regularly for such support. Ah, this is the only passage in the New Testament which directly encourages church attendance. We attend church and we support each other in our journey with Christ. These people faced severe hardship, so it made sense for them to stick together as we do today. We all need to encourage each other. Similarly, the foundations of our confidence or sense of identity is through Christ. This passage is really very real and relevant for us today, although some of the imagery perhaps seems a bit alien at times, doesn't it? 
we hear a fundamental affirmation of God's goodness and love. The truth represented and lived in Christ. And this encourages us as we face challenging situations today. It certainly encourages me. Does it encourage you? It should. It's really so encouraging to hear the truth of Christ. We need to be on the journey to live the way demonstrated by Jesus. Jesus who lived out God's goodness and love right to the very end. As the body of Christ, we need to come together under the banner of Christ's love, compassion and peace to resist negative forces. And we do have negative forces, I'm afraid, in all of our lives. We stand against people like the Romans and many of the Jewish leaders who persisted in abusing others for the sake of maintaining their own power. The passage in Hebrews provides encouragement based on the meaning of Jesus' death on the cross. Through the cross, Jesus mediated God to humans, giving believers new confidence and, and this is so vital, an invitation to relationship. Jesus is the temple of God in its entirety, in his flesh. Nothing of the old temple system is needed anymore for these people, as his death has taken the place of all of its functions. Christ's body became the new temple of God. Jesus never left us. Jesus never left us and will always be there to support us. Verses 23 to 25 direct Christians to support and encourage one another in view of the cross. We are to remember God and allow the cross to set love in motion, absolute love in motion in our lives so that we do good deeds. In the Passion Narrative... John, beginning in John 18, and partly in the uh, second Bible reading, the Passion narrative tells us about Jesus' arrest, trial, crucifixion and burial. And it gives us some unique and life-changing details that stand out in this reading. Jesus died in an act of his own accord and does not ask to escape his death. Throughout John's Gospel, Jesus moves systematically and knowingly towards his hour. Through his arrest, trial, crucifixion and burial, Jesus is not a tragic victim in John. He is, in fact, the ideal hero. Jesus embraces his own suffering for the benefit of others. He is the ultimate servant of others. Jesus' death is meaningful, not only because he dies willingly, but because his death results in the good of the world. The resurrected life of Jesus came through his sufferings on the cross and from the grave. Unfortunately, the treatment of Jesus at his crucifixion was absolutely atrocious. We will now hear this in Reflections on Stations of the Cross. <coughs> Let us come together to walk with Jesus, to be his companions on the way to the cross. We will listen to each reader telling us what happened to Jesus. As you listen to these reflections, we invite you to see with your heart how Jesus can help all of us with the challenges we face at this time. Having faith, like Jesus, helps us to cope with life's difficulties and proceed in love, compassion, and 
hope for the future. Meditations on Stations of the Cross. What happened to Jesus? Although sinless, Jesus is sentenced to death as a criminal. Pilate has the ability to release Jesus, but instead he gives him to what the crowd wants. Pilate thinks Jesus is innocent but he still hands Jesus over to be crucified. Pilate effectively washes his own hands of the matter and the journey to the cross begins. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. This is found in John chapter 19 verse 6 and 7. Now, what is that application to us? Do we fail to stand up for justice and truth? When we do this, we are like Pilate washing his hands. We have failed to take responsibility. How often do I ignore the person no one wants to talk to? Do my words ever condemn you, Jesus, in the way that I speak about others? It was not only the Jews and Pontius Pilate who condemned you, but if I behave badly towards others, I stand next to them shouting just as loudly Crucify him. Jesus carries the cross. <laughs> What happens to Jesus? Jesus not only is condemned to death unfairly, but also must carry the cross on which he will die. The cross is heavy, not only because of the wood, but also because of the weight of all the sins of the world, past, present and future. He takes up the cross out of love. The Roman method of crucifixion was not only physical torture, it was psychological as well. The condemned person was forced to carry their own cross before a hysterical, hysterical mob of people. Jesus was ridiculed, spat on and robbed of his human dignity in the journey of carrying his cross. Application for us. This cruelty still exists in our society when a child is neglected or abused during domestic violence, other forms of bullying, terrorism, or when an elderly person is beaten up. Jesus meets his mother. 
As Jesus carries on, his eyes meet those of his beloved mother. Perhaps Mary meets her son's gaze and gives him the only gift she has left, a loving smile that, while forced, gives her son the strength he needs to continue. Mary's life had revolved about her son from the moment of his birth. She had given birth to him, nurtured him and comforted him. When he became an adult, she had to watch his public life lead him deeper and deeper into conflict with his religious authorities. Now the application for us, there are many times when we feel alone in our struggles. It seems that no one understands what we are going through. How many times have we hidden things from our family or our other loved ones? Out of fear of what they would say or how they would think about us when all they want to do is care for us. Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. Jesus continues his journey to the cross. His friends have deserted him. His body is failing him. His dignity is diminishing. Along the way, Jesus meets a group of women. They have not abandoned him. As Jesus sheds his blood, they shed their tears. Despite his own pain, Jesus stops to console these women. Selfless to the end, he gives them his comfort. The application for us, Jesus was abandoned by all his friends. Every time we feel left out when our friends all make plans and don't invite us, we feel some of Jesus' pain. The women who stayed to support Jesus were outsiders to the in crowd. It's not always easy to decide right from wrong, to live according to Christian values and to remain faithful, but it is always worth it. When we feel like outsiders, we can turn to our families for support and comfort. We can turn to Jesus in times of pain and ridicule. He knows how we feel. He will console and strengthen us, just as he did for the women. How many women today grieve the violent death of their children from domestic violence, terrorism, mass shootings, etc.? <laughs> Jesus is nailed to the cross. What happens to Jesus? Luke 23, 33 tells us, When they reached the place called the skull, they crucified him, and the two criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus reaches the end of the road, and the soldiers crucify him. As they pan great iron spikes through Jesus' wrists and feet, the sound is deafening and echoes throughout the land. The pain is beyond words, yet Jesus bears this out of his love for us. The application for us. In reflection, I am angered by the soldiers. I can't understand why they are doing this to Jesus. And yet what is hardest to realize is that not only am I in the crowd watching all of this, but I'm also one of those nailing him to the cross. How many times has my sin become a strike of the nail into its body? How often do I turn away from your mercy? Jesus dies on the cross. What happens to Jesus? After Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is fulfilled. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is from John 19, verse 30. As Jesus hangs on the cross, 
Each breath is a struggle. After three hours, Jesus can, no, can bear no more. He cries out, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus breathes his last and gives up his spirit, all out of love. An application for us. Jesus, help me never forget your love for me. Help me to know that you died for me. Fill me with comfort in knowing that I never suffer anything you don't understand. Jesus is taken down from the cross. What happens to Jesus? Jesus' body is taken down from the cross and given to his mother one last time. Mary and the faithful disciples grieve and mourn. And yet somehow they stay strong. They serve quietly and humbly without credit or recognition, their love for Jesus remains. As Mary holds her son, her tears wash away the horror of the day. Application for us. How many times have I lost hope in you? How often have I doubted your ability to be God in my life over all things. Jesus is placed in the tomb. What happens to Jesus? Jesus' friends lay his lifeless body in a cold, dark tomb. The journey of the cross seems to end in sadness and desperation. The disciples must have felt that hope, love and goodness died with Jesus too and were laid to rest in the same dark tomb. But today, as people of faith, we know that life would be no more we know that life does not end with that tomb. Jesus died so that death would be no more, so that hope, love and goodness will be ours for eternity. What's the application for us? How many times has death, death felt like the end? When I've lost a loved one, it can be so hard to remember Jesus' victory. How often do I miss the opportunities to say, I love you, to those special people in my life? Do my family and friends know how I feel about them? <coughs> Please join me in prayer. Loving God, help me always remember that death is not the end. Give me the strength to say the words, I love you to those people in my life that I do love. Help me to love every person, not just in words, but also with my actions. Jesus, I love you. I need you. And I trust you. Please depart in silence. The service continues Easter Sunday. <laughs>